of all the men who have made an impact upon the world and the human heart next to Jesus time has least diminished Francis of Assisi if one thinks of oneself standing for a moment poised between two worlds his and ours and looks back upon him with modern eyes his life becomes even more meaningful nostalgic and hopelessly desirable for everything in modern times is exaggerated and intensified until living has become a fever and the throat begins to feel raw and the tongue swollen with the thirst for peace serenity and a return to dignity one comes to francis as to a cooling draught the following is not a life of saint francis of assisi it is not even an essay or an estimate it is a groping for an expression of some of those qualities in him that have touched me deeply in recent years thus if you will accept this as an expression of what saint francis means to me and not what i think he should mean to you or to anyone else we shall both feel more comfortable on the ensuing pages over and beyond the lyric life of francis and the exquisite poem of the brief span of his years on earth i am captivated by his unfailing courtesy his humor cheerfulness and gaiety of spirit but above all his deeply satisfying humility once you have accepted a man as a saint it is difficult to return to the contemplation of him as a man for custom time and canonization throws an aura about him and yet so many of the qualities of francis and the things he did that were accounted saintly were manly too so warm and earthly human and mortal that one thinks one loves him for his manliness only to find then that they approach the divine because of the manner in which they were used to enrich the world we are all endowed in some measure with some traits and capabilities but only francis used them to send up a life long song to his creator for instance throughout his existence one encounters with a kind of pleased astonishment the constant evidence of his gentle courtesy i do not know why one should not look for courtesy in a saint but it does seem foreign to the sometimes chill and austere presence one comes to associate with the holy one remembers thunders sufferers fanatics martyrs mystics zealots and benefactors of mankind but not so many of the exquisite courtesy yet the root of courtesy is love good manners are founded upon the ardent desire not to offend one's fellows and the experience of genuine regret at having done so one feels that the engaging politeness of francis stemmed from his sincerity and the depth of affection he entertained not only for humans but for every object animate and even inanimate that shared living space with him on earth francis had a relationship to everything to man beasts of the field and forests the birds the fish trees flowers even stones the sun the moon the wind and the stars fire and water rain and snow storms the earth summer winter and the tender elegy of springtime with all of these he dealt courteously and admitted them to the circle of his immediate family for a man who believes in and loves his creator with his whole heart must also dignify and love 
all of his creations. Many of the legends regarding Francis, his feeling for his surroundings and the living things that populated the countryside can be misleading. Unless one remembers this matter of courtesy towards and fellow feeling for one's lesser neighbors. There is, for instance, the story of the fisherman who presented Francis with a carp that had just been drawn from the lake. His poet's delight in the silvery beauty of the fish was mingled with pity for its grasping struggles. He returned it to the waters whence it had come. Thankfully, says the tale, the fish followed his boat to the other side of the lake and was waiting when he returned. It is not the legend of the grateful fish that is important but the release. Do we ever experience the deep sense of kinship entertained by Francis for the other inhabitants for our planet? Have we so much as a moment to spare to try to love, understand or pity what we destroy? Francis did not preach a sermon demanding that all fish be returned to the sea or for that matter that we refrain from catching them. But towards that particular one that had swum to his kin, he behaved like a friend and a gentleman. There is nothing that Francis ever said or did to indicate that a man need to be ashamed or feel guilty because of eating a lamb cutlet, provided he loves the living lamb, or that it is wrong to bring down a pheasant with a fowling piece, if one is capable of humbleness in the presence of such a beauty a wing. Francis accepted and lived with the hunter, the fisherman, the farmer, the butcher. He neither humanized nor sentimentalized animals, but he did feel for them, admitting them to their rights of kinship with him and giving them the same courtesy that he bestowed upon his fellows. And if he was sorry for their difficulties in a predatory world, he was also keenly aware of the many beauties and blessings with which they had been endowed. What reaches one's heart is the touching simplicity with which he admitted every living thing to the equality of gratitude towards its maker. We admire the sincerity that led him to preach to the birds, to remind them, to praise and thank him who had endowed them with such lovely plumage, abundant food and graceful power of flight. And it is a gesture of addressing them as fellow creatures that is the wonder of his particular story and not the legendary account of their response at the finish of the sermon. For it is no miracle that all our animal brethren almost invariably react to true courtesy, kindness and consideration. It is simply that there was and still is so little of it practiced in good faith that when it is tried and found to work, it's max of the marvel. Francis must have thought it the most natural thing in the world for the beasts to have responded in kind to his politeness and consideration. We find him experiencing no surprise at the taming of the wolf of Gobino, since he had never believed the beast to be either savage or evil, any more than he believed the bandits he occasionally encountered and turned from their paths to be vicious. The man who can wholeheartedly believe that things are created by God and that God does not create evil is freed from many burdens and one of them is fear. 
Many of us are capable of loving a pet, weeping over a runover dog, or shedding tears over a dead bird. But for the most part, we are only mourning the loss of an extension of our own egos. Old dog Trey is always to us what we think he ought to be and rarely what he actually is. Seldom is he or any of his kind admitted to a friendship or a place on the hearth because he is after all a relative in the large family of the children of the Creator. Francis had pets, a lamb, a peasant, a rabbit, a cicada, a dog, a wolf, but upon honest and unsentimental terms, for he was as polite and considerate to an earthworm, a slug, a bird, a beetle, or a mole, as amusedly tolerant and withal, understanding and warmly loving as one would be to one's brother and sister. Indeed, they were his brothers and sisters. He called them so, not with the pious emptiness the words have come to connote in modern times, but with the deep conviction of the kinship. It is told of him that he would stoop to remove an earthworm from his path so as to not crush it. One feels that with Francis it was a personal as well as a symbolic courtesy to something living he happened to encounter. There appears to be a touch of the child's world of fancy in this, but it is really an intensely practical way of life aboard an overpopulated planet and what is more, it has the great advantage of beauty over ugliness. Looking back to the daily joy and happiness that Francis managed to crowd into the 44 years of his life, it is not all that difficult to understand that it is better to be kind than unkind and to be generous and accommodating instead of rude and possessive. This is not childish, it is one of the most adult discoveries ever made. And one notes with equal satisfaction that Francis expected a full return of courtesies. And what is more, he got it. For in that state of nature which exists in the faith that all is divinely created with love and delight in beauty, and who shall say that a maggot, a spider, a rat, or a hippopotamus is not beautiful in the eyes of God? There must be give as well as take. Thus, there is no difficulty in understanding his request to the noisy swallows wheeling, looping, twittering in the late afternoon sky, drowning out Francis' attempt to preach. With their chatter. My brothers and sisters, the swallows, it is now time for me to speak. You must have been speaking enough all the time. Give me leave to be heard. It is recorded that the swallows piped down. In the same spirit was his request to Brother Fire in the shape of a red hot iron physicians were about to use to cauterize his temples in an attempt to cure his growing blindness late in his life. Brother Fire, who art nobler and more useful than most other creatures, I have always been good to you and always will be so for the love of him who created you. Now show yourself gentle and courteous with me and do not burn me more than I can stand. One can only long for a world in which Brother Fire indeed responds in kind to such a gentle and persuasive plea. For when it was over, Francis said to the physicians, If that is not enough burning, then burn it again, 
for I have not felt the least pain. These are the pictures that uplift the spirit and enchant the heart. A worn and sightless man who through faith and simplicity has found the key to communicating with the universe. The biographers write that Francis was personally unprepossessing and undistinguished in appearance and then offer usually some kind of apologetic gloss for the fact that physically the gay little tramp of God did not measure up to the standards set by the imagination for the good and the holy. But it is precisely because Francis was an insignificant looking little black haired fellow with his crony neck and uninspiring features that I find myself loving him the more and cherishing the figure of him that I conjure up for myself. Francis's own estimate of his person is indicated by his reference to himself as little black hen, thus at once creating an amusing and warming picture in one's mind of a small, dark, busy fellow with an alert and glittering eye, narrow head, thin shoulders and pipe stem legs, pecking and scratching about his business, poking into everything and never still for a moment. Almost as captivating in the amazement of Brother Maceo, one of his early disciples from Marignano, who one day said to Francis in effect, How do you get away with it? Look at you. There is nothing to you. You haven't got looks. You don't got any kind of a figure. You have no learning and aren't even of noble birth to make up for everything else you lack. And yet the whole world runs after you and wants to see you and hear you and obey you. I can't make it out. Francis replied simply that God had selected him, the poorest, most miserable and wretched specimen on the whole earth to do his work, using Francis as an instrument wherewith to shame the noble, the great, strength and beauty and worldly wisdom and make it clear that all power and virtue come from him and not from creatures and that no one can exalt himself before his face. It is curious that in the old walled city with its churches and squires and crooked cobbled streets clinging to the side of Monte Subasio, one still feels the presence of Francis so strongly after more than 700 years. It is not only that he is remembered spiritually, but here he was born and lived. Every alley, every market square or plaza, every time-worn stone upon which one stands or rests one's eyes once felt the touch of his feet or the passage of the rough hem of his habit sweeping by. Here is the house where he first saw the light of day. There the church where he was baptized. At this fountain he surely paused some time to drink. From that stairway he exhorted his fellows to love their maker and one another. It seems impossible that he has departed from these houses and passageways and arches, the squares and gathering places that his eyes looked upon these rooftops, eaves and tall chimneys, the stone towers that listened to his voice rising from the winding streets below in song or poetry, or simple praise from a heart bursting with joy. There is the feeling that one has but to turn one more corner to encounter him, striding along barefoot in his frayed and patched, mud-colored robe tied at the waist with a piece of rope, black-haired, black-bearded, dirty as a sweep from the task of cleaning out a church, hands roughened, fingernails cracked and blackened by hard work, a busy, bustling man, not loitering, but going somewhere, 
with a kind of zestful excitement that he carries along with him. His expression alive and cheerful and full of interest for everything about him. And yet in the dark, expressive eyes one notes the pervading calm that marks the haze of those who have conquered self. Outside the walls too, the marketplace above the city is unchanged by time. And along the chalky roads that wind about the mountain, one looks again to catch a glimpse of the sweet, ugly, unkempt, dusty little man, always a little gaunt from discipline and fasting, always sweat or travel stained, pausing perhaps to ransom the lives of two lambs from some peasant leading them to slaughter. And one feels too that no one ever had to point and say, There! That little one who looks like nothing at all. That is Francis of Assisi. He was no spellbinder or thunderer with menacing gestures and brazen voice, but only a simple man with an idea in which he believed to the exclusion of everything that was false or mean. The impact of the saints upon the modern world appears to be diminishing. They are agreeable and stimulating stories in a book or wood, stone or plaster figures in the niches of old churches staring their supplicants down with painted eyes. Yet no one in history is capable of sending such piercing trumpet blasts down the corridors of time as the meek, lowly, the humble and self-sacrificing and the devoted. The soldiers, statesmen and conquerors catch the eye and the intellect, but the lovers of God capture our hearts. If, in a sense, the saint was often created by times and the need for him in a sick world, the illness appears to return with cyclic insistence in such periods when humanity becomes poisoned by too persistent a dose of its own evil, one is suddenly aware of something golden shining in the darkness that surrounds the human soul. This is when one presses one's nose against the seemingly impenetrable window panes of the past with an almost juvenile yearning for a share of the spiritual beauty that lies so clearly visible on the other side. Saint Francis in particular defies the would-be imitator for his courage was so gigantic, his faith so unswerving, his simplicity so unassailable and his consistency so unique that his like has not been encountered since. In this bleak barren era of too much material abundance, one can still warm oneself at the fires Francis kindled seven centuries ago and reduced the growing chill in one's heart at the flame of the example of this man whose entire mature life was nothing but one inexhaustible pouring out of love. Yet, because one is human, one finds oneself attracted to the humanity in a godly figure. I find myself particularly enchanted by the contemplation of this 12th century man inspired by divine fire, equipped with the indomitable will and moral courage needed to pursue the inspiration, who was yet leavened with humor and who had that occasional impish small boy quality that is so endearing when it is found in truly adult men. For Francis was possessed of the light humor of wit and grace, the heritage of his younger days in Assisi, when he was town host, playboy and troubadour. By living and acting as he did, he made many other ways of living and acting seem ridiculous. He appeared to be doing what he did with great import and seriousness. Nevertheless, he had a mischievous and merrily sly way of undermining all kinds of tyrannies that complicate our lives 
such as wealth, birth and ambition. He was likewise a master of the humor that is directed against that weak and frail vessel, self. For instance, he had another name for his person, besides the little black hen, which he applied when he found the spirit more willing than the flesh to endure the hard labor of rebuilding churches by hand. He would refer to his body as brother ass and order it to do his bidding as one would the little pack animal. The joke is even more tender than usually imagined, for in Italy the donkey is less the symbol for stupidity and stubbornness than it is for patience and hard work. For centuries it has been a part of the scene, a beast of burden that goes to Sele where it is led and thus what it is made to do, often staggering uncomplainingly beneath cargoes that appear far too great for its capacity. Like all saints and ascetics, Francis conducted a running feud with his body during his lifetime, but he is the only one who bestowed a name upon his own unwilling carcass that brings a smile to the lips. With Francis, the joke was always upon himself. It was he who was the fool and never anyone else, hence more often than not, there were tears mingled with the laughter he engendered. It is a classically comic situation when a pious fellow who preaches abstinence and self-control is caught in gluttony, his features still greasy from the feast. How much funnier and withal deeply touching it becomes when it is Francis who, as it were, puts the finger on himself and has himself towed through town on a halter by a disciple, the meanwhile crying, Look here, you people. This is the man who asks you to fast and repent while he himself feasts on a tender bird just because his stomach hurts him a little. That glutton, that reveller, that hypocrite. His impish and adorable small boyish quality comes to light in the masquerade he enacted one Easter when the brothers of the convent at Crescio, expecting a visitor of importance, so far forgot the principles of their order as to set a table with cloth and glasses. Just as they were sitting down to table with the distinguished guest, there came a knock on the door, and a voice known to them all, but now filled with exaggerated unction, cried, For the love of God, give alms to this poor and infirm pilgrim. When they opened the door, everyone saw that it was Francis disguised in an old hat left behind by a beggar and with staff and clock. Bidden to enter by the unhappy brothers, he completed their confusion by taking his bowl of soup and piece of bread and crouching down on his heels in a corner by the fireplace. Here again is his favorite comedy of example. But one feels that his deepest chuckles were reserved for the divine practical prank he played on the concept of money. Jesus was outraged and angry when he drove the money changers from the temple. But I am certain that Francis was laughing inwardly when he ordered some money that had been left during his absence to be thrown down into the dung heap. He could have ordered it thrown into the dust at the side of the road, or into the fields, or let it be swept away by the stream. But no, by the dung heap he designated its merit, quality and value. He labelled it unmistakably for what it is and the place it deserves in the scheme of things. The humour is low, earthy, Italian, but retains the divine directness that strikes to the core. I come now to that quality of Francis 
that I love the most, and that is his humility and genuine un or anti arrogance. He faced up to himself, learned to know himself truly for what he was in relation to his God and the world in which he lived. And thereupon, he simply shed every arrogance known to man and invited those who cared to do so to join him in doing likewise. He found paradise on earth and generously offered to share it with his fellows. It is true, arrogances were fewer and simpler in those days and in the less complex society only recently emerged from the dark ages when man did not have so much to puff him up. There was the arrogance of living on a hill with armed retainers in a stone castle, the arrogance of golden spurs and the arrogance of bulging coffers. There was the arrogance of learning in the days when the ignorant and unlettered were in the majority. The super arrogance of those who claimed to rule man by divine right and the arrogance that sometimes went with custody over the keys to heaven. And with these there was an end to them. A fellow might be cock in fine clothes, or set too rich a table, or carry his armor to the inlayers and engravers. But outside of that, man was on the whole not extravagantly pleased with himself. The indecent and shameful arrogances of our times, by comparison, almost ennobled those that Francis persuaded his disciples to surrender in following his example. It makes one hark back with longing to a period when ridding oneself of them was no more complicated than selling all of one's possessions and taking to the road, like the rich merchant Bernardo of Quantuale or laying aside sword, armor, and war charger to take up the cross like Angelo Tancredi, or hanging up one's lute at the altar and exchanging the party-colored horse and stashed doublet of the Drupador de Dames for the robe and robe of the jungler de Dieu, like Divini the poet. Now the roaster of the humble has been cut Many more of us live in palaces and eat the food of princes. A fool can make a war and lead a world to slaughter. Learning has elbowed its way through the firmament a hundred billion light years closer to God's throne, but not one split second nearer to him in spirit. All the arrogances of civilization and the mechanical progress have been added to the list the arrogance of the wise guy and the huckster, of the lucky, the cunning and the self-made, the narcissist orgy of a mankind gone mad with admiration for its own cleverness. When the symphony of self-adulation becomes unbearable, the mind is rested in turning to Francis, the humble, unprepossessing little poet of life with the golden heart the clear, unsullied spirit and the unbelievable courage to strip himself of everything. It is not difficult to understand how in his day entire villages and communities flocked to this voluntary poor man who had demonstrated the exquisite joy of possessing nothing beyond the sun and the stars, the warmth of fire, the cooling draught of water, the color and perfume of a flower. It was dark in those days too, until Francis threw open the window of his soul and let the daylight in. Taught by the example of Francis, many throughout the world for the first time approached some of the beauties of the mind and spirit that are not encumbered by the arrogances of possessions. I would not have the courage to follow Francis today. But the need for him and everything for which he stood is deeply felt. The higher the civilization, the more brash and insufferable the arrogance is, the dearer the longing for the simplicity, peace and humility of which Francis was capable. 
for I trust him because after he had stripped himself of everything he had the last shred of clothing the shoes from his feet the staff from his hand the food from his lips when he had learned to sleep out in the chilling rain with a stone for a pillow when he could sell even the book of the scriptures that nourished him spiritually to provide bread for a woman in distress then it was that this great creative artist of the world's most beautiful poem of living wrote the climax of his farewell to earthly pride for he shed even the last remaining arrogance the arrogance of poverty and humility take no pride of your voluntary poverty he counsels the brothers for behold there is a beggar even more ragged miserable and threadbare than you and you are in debt to him for everything you have he forbids his disciples in their pride of poverty to dare to condemn those who dress in fine clothes and live in luxury and happiness or to whine complain or criticize the rich as the brothers wander through the world they shall be mild modest humble and friendly to all they shall not contend with one another and they shall judge no one and above all they must be cheerful let the brothers take care he wrote that they do not present the appearance of hypocrites with dark and downcast mien but that they show themselves glad in the lord cheerful and worthy of love and agreeable this abnegation of the sweets of sacrifice this joy within joy was the ultimate in unselfish giving in the long catalog of things that francis surrendered in order to approach nearer to the god he loved it shines with the purest light through the black centuries of human behavior this man i cherish him i envy greatly for i long for the happiness that was his the power to attract and to move the human soul has never left him that is why a sisi is yet so filled with him that you feel surely at the next square by that old stone fountain you will find him striding along the cowl of his robe thrown back from the small dark head his voice raised in the melodies and language of provence singing from his full and grateful heart the words of praise and thanks to him who created all things so beautiful but more touching than anything is to descend the many steps of the basilica of his church to reach the crypt where he is buried and to find his resting place no dark and musty mausoleum but a simple little chamber that is filled with a kind of light and airy grace the crypt and the tomb itself are echoes of the poverty and simplicity he quoted during his lifetime for men moved by what he was and did have built a chimney to his sarcophagus an opening that admits light and air and at night the stars and in the day at certain times the sun he loved so greatly sends a shaft slanting down through the opening and it seems to shine directly into the great heart that is buried there the symbolism is inescapable so shines francis the shaft of his being aimed at the heart of a world that grows darker by the hour